everybody. Welcome to Gathering of the Minds. I'd like to, uh, but I get the next opportunity to do but I, I'd like to maybe provide or offer a, like a philosophical context for the thinking about the discussion. I've been studying this book recently, but do people know Ken Wilber? Yeah. Uh, tech World Theory, and he has a new book out called Trump and the Post-Truth World. Uh, for me, it was really, really clarifying and really helpful. So Wilber's whole idea is a spiral dynamics model, which argues that there is an evolution of consciousness that happens through people kind of reaching um, you know, more encompassing perspectives. You know, so, you know, in the way, in the way we view even in an individual lifespan from childhood to adulthood. So people start out with being self-interest, then they have interest in their family or their, their local community or their ethnic identity or their national identity. And then these are different means that he assigns different colors to. You know, he believes that since the 1960s, the, the leading edge of consciousness on the planet has been what he calls the green, the green mean. And about 20% of, of the population in the U.S., he argues, is, 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 around, is in this green leading edge. And it's um, you know, postmodern, he characterizes as pluralistic, um, world-centric, no longer out of this idea of ethnic identities, believing that everybody has a right to you know, live and prosper and so on. Um, but uh, but, as, but, as, but as that, as, as that uh, form of consciousness has become predominant, its negative polarities have also become more uh, evident. And what those are is if you don't believe, if you, if you believe that everybody is equal, then, then the, the, the negative aspect is there's no, there's no privileged position. You know, there's also no truth, so it collapses into relativism. Uh, uh, Ken Wilber calls it a perspectival madness. And so, um, as, and so deconstruction is an example of this. It's like, yeah, there's no truth, there's no privileged position, and so on. And, and so what's that, what, what that's caused is it opened a gap uh, that allowed for this Trump nightmare to happen. Uh, because when there's no truth, and you could say, oh, it's all fake news, it's only bias, and so on. And, and so now we're in a world where, uh, yeah, we can't establish a better, a, what's better than something else as a worldview. And, and, and Wilbur says that actually we have to recognize, I mean, the, the, this pluralistic postmodern worldview is against hierarchies. But, you, but instead of hierarchies, he proposes we think of, of what he talks about as growth holarchies. That actually there is a natural evolution from ethnocentric identity to kind of planet, you know, planet-centric or even cosmocentric identity, and and, and therefore there, there is and that is an advantage in, in advance. Like it is better to not be trapped in an ethnic identity or to identify as a fascist who doesn't like black people or Jews or whatever, you know. And and, and so yeah, I mean, in that sense, I think you know media should have a function, you know, conscious media should have a function of trying to help lead humanity away from these, you know, sort of atavistic identities that are actually causing so much strife on the planet by helping them understand an ecological and holistic perspective. And that, that's what I would personally prefer to see something like mine says. It's not necessarily about negating these other worldviews, but, you know, but, but figuring out a way to, um, I don't know, to, to, to diminish their, their hold in people's psychology. Because so they have a kind of negativity, has a kind of hypnotic uh, thrall on people, and catches them in a kind of fascination loop, uh, which then leads to things like school shootings and uh, you know, racist uprisings and so on. That's a very fascinating observation, and I'd be interested in what everybody thinks. But i actually like to start with Sticks. What, Sticks, what do you think about uh, what Daniel just said right now? I think that there's, if you have that deconstructivist view and you don't believe maybe in an objective right or wrong and you're going from merely the pragmatic, look around at the world today and the results of multiculturalism and censorship, they're not positive. The problem is there will always be a misapplication of any censorship, no matter how benevolent a certain person or group may be in Six. trying, to, in trying to establish it. Six. I really don't feel like you really heard what I said. I don't really feel you're answering what I had to say. I mean, you're answering something else, which is okay, but I wasn't. It doesn't really feel like it answers what I was trying to uh, express there. I, mean, I don't know if what's, the, what's the central point then, in, that, in a that, nutshell? Constructive postmodern relativistic worldview is actually something to, to to acknowledge and also to transcend, but but not to then say there's no hierarchy. I mean, you can say there's no hierarchy, but there, but there is an evolutionary trajectory which is towards more inclusion and and recognizing a kind of holistic ultimately a holistic understanding that we are all one species connected to the planet. We, we, we you know, we have an interconnectedness, a responsibility for the whole, like that, that's the trajectory we 
need to go with it, right? Yeah. So, I, I would, I would, I would disagree with that myself. I think it's important to keep in mind differences between individuals and groups for the purposes of governing one's life. Ultimately, though, but 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 let's go going a little bit further. Let's assume that you say that that's it's utopian, it's good, it's it's positive. You can't force other people to take part in it. How does that have anything to do with maybe tech firms or journalists attempting to coerce people? It just gives, a, trust me, it gives more ammunition to people like myself who are looking for an excuse to attack the corporate media because the corporate media and every other aspect, you're, you're essentially saying groups like maybe a CNN or whatever, I'm not sure, should, despite the fact that they, they tried to promulgate war, they themselves exploit hate. They try to uh, use wedge issues, people's differences, to cause them to be at each other's throats so they can sensationalize and make money. Despite that fact, you would want them to be like the moral guardians of the universe. I think that's a terrible idea. Of course, uh, how do you get that perspective? That's totally not anything that I have to say. I think what uh, Daniel was trying to say, okay, I, th I think I could be the mediator here, I'm, perhaps. I'm really not, I mean, I'm not a fan of corporate media, but I, mean, I do think that, you know, in this collapse into the negative pole of the green meme that Ken Wilber talks about, which sticks, I have to say, is exactly from my perspective where you're anchored right now. Um, you know, um, when there's such a rejection of evidence-based journalism, and, you know, I've written for the New York Times, and I don't like the New York Times. I, they're infiltrated by the CIA. There's no doubt you can go back to their history how they promoted the Iraq War and yada yada. But you know, when you write for them, there is a, a bedrock of, of journalism and fact checking, you know, which is impressive, you know, which you don't find on a lot of the other yeah, every every quote is checked, every fact is checked. It's just checked. It just yes. Yeah, not true. I, 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 I work that's, that's totally wrong. I'm talking about the New York Times. Right, right. So I'm not saying that they're a paragon. I don't like corporate media. I'm not a paragon of, of corporate media. I'm saying there are standards that, that, that actually have meaning and value that should be then brought into this you know, alternative realm rather than this kind of like, um, kind of like what's developing is this sense of like a total kind of vapid relativism where there's no there's there's no point of view that's of more value than any other point of view which isn't going to help us as a, as a species we should collapse into the miasma that we're already collapsing into who decides what point of view is the right one well that's why i gave you wilbur as a perspective and i rec recommend a few of his books i mean he's not even my, my favorite thinker but i think in this in this you know circumstance he's very useful because there is an evolutionary trajectory and there are point of views that are more encompassing more humane and actually better you know, to, to, to care about, you know, the earth and the future of humanity is better than collapsing into an ethnospheric racist or some similar type of identity, which is separatist and won't allow us to grow past this point. Well, Daniel, if, for example, in the Kabbalah, we have the idea of the spirit world, which is always giving off something, while we are always receiving something. If in the end we're all supposed to become as one and be able to telepathically communicate with each other, which I think is going to happen in the future, in the world that we're stuck in right now, we're still going to be full of selfish people who are going to be misusing emotions and emotionally volatile people for their own ends. And that's going to be a big problem when it comes to how do we know what the right decision is. So sh how, how careful should we be when, it, be when it comes to, okay, I'm gonna do this because it feels really, really good, because it feels really nice and righteous and noble, and how could that be misused against us? Can I propose a litmus test in that, that for a, a couple months ago, there were millions of views going to videos of children that were force feeding other children feces, children in bathtubs with feces and blood in it. That's really weird, horrible. creepy stuff. And, and the, the Spider-Man costume was put on guys that were beating Oh, yeah, you're talking about Elsa Gate. Elsa Gate, yes. yeah. And if you'll notice, a lot of the people who were recently banned were people who were very critical of those videos and the yeah. fact that they were being suggested somehow by the algorithm for children. And those people, like like Titus Frost got, got banned, he got thrown off, he was very critical of the, what he was calling the kind of pedophile videos. And I think that maybe also destroyed the illusion also, he got kicked off. And so I actually, have, like, I haven't followed this stuff, so I have no idea what you're talking about, but I do think you need to be careful about what you allow your own mind to dwell in, like dwelling in something that's that grotesque. Um, you were really interested. Okay. You were really big. This is actually really interesting, and I think it's great you brought it up, because Elsa Gate is what happens when there is no oversight. Yeah. What, what happened was, for those that don't know, uh, the YouTube algorithm, when somebody watches a video for a long period of time, YouTube says, these, the words in the title, the words in the description and tags, must be good things. And so parents will turn YouTube on and hand it to their baby. The baby doesn't touch anything, sometimes might mash the keyboard. 
And so YouTube auto plays based on the video and it goes down this weird, it's kind of like a, what's that deep image search thing Google did where pictures are getting really weird. Someone makes a video of Elsa singing from Frozen and then someone else makes a video dressed up as Elsa. Eventually you really did end up with, I, I, it's hard to say, but depictions of children eating feces simply because the algorithm worked and people, they, they were bots producing content. They were human beings who said, hey, this is what works and makes us money and gets you know a million views, I'm gonna make it. And some of these high profile users were banned. That's what happens when there is no guiding force. Then we have the other problem. When someone determines, you know, a small group of people or individual, what should be, then they start censoring content saying your ideas aren't good and shouldn't be on the platform, and you start losing legitimate conversation. So those are the two extremes. Mm -hmm. Don't you want a transcript of tonight's show? <laughs> this is fantastic. May I ask a very simple question? This happened recently. Let's say you're on Twitter, just a regular person, and you say, you know what? I think these people in Florida, these students, I think they're crisis actors. I don't think, not that there wasn't a shooting, but I think they're paid, or I don't like them, or I, whatever. And you enter this, upload it, and all of a sudden they shut your account down because you're Facebook does the same thing. You can't say that. People say, yes. And there's a sense of how dare you. And then YouTube does it. Now, here's the question. Is that okay? Is it just that? Nah, it's Twitter. It's not like it's a free speech violation. It's no big deal. They've got their rules. Start up your own Twitter. Anybody see a problem with that? Because that happens all the time. Very, very simply. Or you will write something for whatever reason. You didn't phrase it correctly. We're not talking about infantile caprophagia. I think even that gross. Pretty simple. I don't think this is real. Or I think it might have been a period of history, a particular story that didn't occur. I'm a revisionist. I don't believe it. It's my opinion. Nothing profane. I've got four followers. No big deal. They shut my account. Do I have any repercussions? Do I have any right? Or is that just the way it is? Because that's the issue. Somebody doesn't like your opinion. It's not the government. You're not being arrested, you're just shut down from your Twitter. What right do you have to just say things in the public domain? I'd like to point out why that's a bigger problem than just having an opinion. Uh, not too long ago after the Florida incident happened, the Associated Press reported that a white nationalist took credit saying that the shooter trained his camps. A little bit of research and you'd find out that it was likely a hoax perpetrated by users on the Discord platform who were trying to just Trick the media. The Associated Press reported as fact. They cited the Anti-Defamation League, who cited 4chan as fact, which was surprising to me. Several different news outlets then sourced the AP, saying it was all true. I made a video that day where I said, this is likely a hoax. This is, and I showed uh, some clips of why it was likely a hoax. I can't say definitively, but we know these people were attempting to do this for some time. And citing 4chan as fact is not a good idea. And who is this guy claiming? He was actually, uh, actually had this kid at his camp anyway. This is not confirmed. YouTube took my video down and issued a community guideline strike saying that I was harassing and bullying presumably the white nationalists, which was shocking to me. <laughs> the next day, the Associated Press issued a correction. Yes, they shouldn't have sourced the Anti-Defamation League who found some random guy on the internet. And at, a day later, YouTube brought my video back. <laughs> no word, no apology, no correction. So what happens when someone at YouTube or another platform decides you know what, you're probably wrong because a, a large corporate news entity says, you know, disagrees with you. Well, then there's going to come a time when a legitimate story comes out. I, I think a lot of these conspiracy theories are, are, are crazy. I mean, they, they're, they're, but they're real conspiracy theories. We know that they, But what right do you have to YouTube? Let's assume everything you're saying is exactly correct. You're, you just expressed something and somebody overreacted or not. What right do we have to express speech on social content? It's a very simple question. Is there a right, or is that just the way it goes? Start yeah. your own. Whether or not it's a right or not, I didn't violate any of their guidelines. That was a false strike. And if you are unfairly taken down, what? That's the issue. Here, here's the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Any of you in the oh, yeah. Sure, yes. Yeah. All right. John Perry Barlow, poor, I know, I mean, these are guys that really started in 1990 with what the beginning of this discussion was. It's evolved like six different times. It used to be, I mean, are you are you in touch with people like that? Are you talking to these people? These are people who can take your case to the court. This is something about trust that's going on. 
it used to be in my youth, when I was your age, that we had certain newspapers and television channels that we watched, each one bearing a certain kind of point of view. We knew when we read the editorial of the Wall Street Journal, which still today is very conservative. We knew that we read the rest of the paper, it was just journalistic news, holistic, they were afraid of the op ed people, in fact. But uh, if you read uh, you know, the Post, you get a, you know, you know what you're getting. Anyway, so you knew if you read the Christian Science Monitor or you read the Harlem newspaper, or you, were, you knew what you were reading and you bought it for that reason. And if you were a, a journalist, you were reading all those papers to get all the points of view. You're talking about this bubble. What's happening here is that every single one of you, multiplied by how many in an infinite test, infinite to a number, all have an opinion. And you're smart, so you're sitting here, and I enjoy listening to you. But there are a lot of dumbasses out there who are putting these stupid things with the children eating God knows what on the bottom. And, and you know what? I am suddenly handing that to a child, or I, because of an algorithm. But that's your fault. No, 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 no. It is my fault. But so what? The no, question is, you can't go to court. You can't say, wait a minute, they took my no, thing out. I want to pull up the EFF. That's, that's true. The DMCA. But and what is reason thing? and right? That's a different issue, well, though. Right. right. That's so right. Is right. right. We're very good Where is the law? Where is it? What do you do? Do you have any right? Yes, you're right about that. What about reasonableness? Aside from reasonableness, aside from that, why did I? Aside from that, what do you have a right to do that we should strive for? Different argument. Different argument. It's not a different argument. We're not I'm talking about it. that they should be merged. We're not talking. No, no. Yes, what I'm saying is if law, you are, okay, if you just said law, what you just said right now, and Twitter decided to shut you down, you have a microphone for sure. That we made laws with reasonable people who created a world that came from people who thought we were going to act with reason. And when we we're out of that reasonableness, out of that sense of what it, a child knows right and wrong. A child knows when they're doing something naughty, when they take the cookie or when they, they do something and pull the cat's tail. They know it. And then they kind of see what mommy's going to do or daddy's going to do. We know when we're not putting, we, we, we know what's right and wrong. The right to put all this this crap on the, on the air, yes, have the right, but ha when, when that idiot who likes those pictures back 40 years ago or 20 years ago when none of the internet was around for me to have to see it, I don't want to see the guy putting a child eating feces. I think you're being forced. Dear God, let him show his four friends. I think they were really participants. No, I don't want to see those this is, we have to have some sense of reason. Part of the problem is it's the decay of our capacity to reason and act ethically as a society. It's like atrophy, I and mean, somehow the social media system is actually accelerating that atrophication. And, and, and we don't quite know what to do with it. So let's just acknowledge that we don't quite know what to do about it. And, and I don't think that, I mean, even what you were describing, when you were, it didn't seem to me like terrible. You know, it felt to me like, there's like a system that's trying to figure out, like an immune system, how to react. So yeah, like they, you know, people report something and it's wrong, they're human, they get carried away. The next day there's a retraction, you know, that YouTube is somehow connected to these more established forms of information, brokering, and they pull it and then put it back on. It doesn't seem to me, you know, catastrophic. They never put it up, you know, back on or if they took you off YouTube entirely, that would certainly be, you know, and it's you know, it's obviously important that people are looking at this and testing the limits of it and so on, that, that's part of the process. I think on a deeper level, the problem is that um, we're all like alienated individuals in this huge society that's got out of control without any community structures. Like, I think in the past, it'd be the community that would sort of hold people accountable. That would maybe like, uh, you know, there would be some form of like, oh, like my views have gone crazy, therefore my neighbors aren't listening to me anymore. You know, or they don't, or they're, or they're not, or they're, you know, that nobody wants to hang out with me. Now people are going crazy in these like isolated silos, and, and they're just screaming online, and they're finding other lunatics who listen to that screaming. And unfortunately, I'm a little afraid that platforms like mine's maybe help amplify that a little bit. Stakes, your gears are probably uh, turning right now as uh, far as what you're going to uh, talk about. One thing that I would really like for you to address is. Do you see there being a uh, shadowy catastrophe coming with this dissolution? Or do you see in the next generation, the generation that, for example, listens to you, something else sprouting, something that we may have lost? I, I would say simply that we need to determine where we're going to go as a society. Things tend towards polarization, that much is clear. We have to determine, are we going to throttle the entire internet, uh, throttle the information on it, and uh, a lot of people who create content? 
Now, or are we going to have more or less a free and open internet? I think Lionel was touching on something important. That is, there's a differentiation between your right, specifically and legally speaking, to use a platform like YouTube and Twitter. And I would say the pragmatic side of it, which is, should these platforms, uh, is it sane? Is it a good idea for them to engage in censorship? I still think that there's an opportunity for simply uh, grassroots support to prevent the worst aspects of censorship. It's not a case where you have to have either total lawlessness or you know total authoritarian nanny state YouTube. It's a case where YouTube already had rules against the kind of content that we're discussing. It was already it already would have been determined as spam. It's just that nobody apparently nobody wanted to touch the issue. The people that did tend to touch that issue tended to be on the fringe of YouTube, in some cases ideologically, and then they were targeted for bringing it up, probably by the same people making money off that nonsense. Meanwhile, though, we've got NGOs that fundamentally, instead of looking at tidal waves of spam, uh, uh, protecting children, protecting you know, sex trafficking, stuff like that, instead of focusing on legitimate issues on YouTube that clog up the platform or are criminal, they're worried about something that could be construed as offensive or somebody, they fired a gun and so an, an algorithm determines that it's war footage, it demonetizes it. I would say I'm in perhaps a unique position compared to many creators. I've never monetized any content. I rely upon book sales and grassroots support. I never used AdSense. I'm damn glad that I didn't. Uh, that's just a part of it though. It goes well past anything regarding money on both ends. And it goes into the realm of, of pure philosophy, which is, is it a good idea? Will the platform remain healthy? Will creators be able to make ends meet, put their stuff out there? And is it sane and moral uh, to algorithmically demote, to demonetize, to begin striking people's stuff down? I, I'm seeing some of these groups, they sit there crowing. They're like, oh, our algorithm, 83% of the time, it gets it right on hate speech, you know, whatever that amounts to according to their standards. 83%. So roughly one out of five times it fails and it gives somebody a strike for something that's totally innocuous. That doesn't make me sleep very well at night thinking about spending a decade. I've been on, the, on YouTube for a decade. I'm making content there. I've been on Facebook for a decade, Twitter only, I think two years now actually at this point. I'm making all this content. I have no specific guarantee that some random rogue staffer doesn't decide they don't like me and kicks me off of a platform or some algorithm gets it totally wrong and maybe I stop being able to post for a week. I mean, you know, I mean, as Lionel kind of mentioned, I mean, YouTube and Google are not public infrastructure also. They're private companies that, you know, and, you know, yeah, we do also have the right, you could start your own, you know, open source platform or, I mean, you know, sorry if that does happen to you unfairly or something, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, but, but, you know, these are not like, you know, these are arbitrary brokers, they're private companies well, that instead of taking the place of public utilities and stuff. Are they also quasi-governmental entities as well? Like how much influence does the government have on these companies? <laughs> like giving them seed money to start? Are you getting aside from that? <laughs> well, I think it was a good point. You know, we had this way back and he could go to bring this back to our, our, our constitutional forebears and this idea of the government. But now we have this particular thing here. And now we're going to ask ourselves, what about surveillance? What about surveillance and rights and privacy? And who gets to see this stuff? Who gets, again, the government loves to sit back and say, it's not us, it's Apple, or taking up with Sprint, or whoever it was. We're in this unique world right now, this weird, as you say, quasi government, where these organizations are so big, so large, so plenary, so ubiquitous, that we're going to ask ourselves, ask courts, legislation perhaps, to ask to reconsider these people as almost being quasi governmental. And to apply the First Amendment the same way. Because if all of a sudden, if I say, listen, we don't like your book for whatever reason, and I decide I'm Google and it's gone, in some respects, it just disappeared. And you can say, no, it's still there. You can find it. So the question is, when something is of that size and that enormity, are we going to have to regroup? And what everybody said as far as society going to hell in a handbasket, agreed 100%. We're definitely, we're fed, and we're odious, we're hard. I understand that. <laughs> but the question I have too is when do we say, how do we ever benefit by saying no? You can't say that. And forget the extreme kids eating feces and that sort of child pornography. How, when do we somehow just say, you know what, we're going to err on the side of just letting people say everything 
and let the community perhaps do something, or with some grassroots. Although well, we also have another issue coming up, which is the deep fake, and the fact that now there's not going to be any capacity to tell if a video is real or not. So there'll be a, there'll be a video of Obama, you know, noshing on Jewish babies or something, and it'll look just like Obama. And, and you know, but but I mean, and, you know, you can be sure that that is going to be weaponized by you know, um, you know all sorts of you know horrible. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Ability is pretty well done. Oh, it's, 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 it's exists right there's, now. There's, yeah. I mean, this is a great discussion, yeah. but maybe supplanted by the real fake stuff that's generated by AI. Adobe also is working on a fake Photoshop right now. Basically, it's a vocal version of Photoshop, and apparently, they're going to be able to emulate to those voices within the next yeah. five years. Or just the CIA that created fake beheading videos. Like the Pentagon has, or had the Pentagon has its own propaganda that's, wing. That's but, yeah. that's it. I have, no, but I'm saying it. it's another example, which is right. very frightening because the, then our government uses that as evidence to perpetuate war. Well, yeah, so right. My point being that that is really horrifying because they are then in control of the missiles. I mean, I can post a fake video of me eating a baby. I can't also launch missiles. So what are you guys going to do?